Hi guys, thanks so much for joining us. I hope that you're well. Hi Wendy, thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me, this is fun. I'm really excited to have you. Uh, so guys, today we're gonna be chatting about pretty much what, like the most important thing that we could be, and that's time management and owner expectations. Because if we get those wrong, um, we're gonna burn out, our owners are gonna be unsatisfied, and we're not gonna be able to help our patients. Uh, so Wendy came up with this topic, and I'm really glad she did, because there's so much for us to chat about and to share um, in terms of managing expectations and managing our time. Um, so I wanna know from you guys, this is us coming on live on Facebook is all about you. So share your questions with us, your experiences, your challenges, be part of the conversation, let us know where you are in the world um, and chat with us so that, yeah, so that you guys can get the most out of this. Um, so Wendy, before we get started um, and before we jump into this really important topic, I have been asking everyone who we chat to the same question. Um, so you guys know we're gearing up for the Vet Rehab Summit and I couldn't be more excited because we are going to be chatting about research meets reality. Um, so Wendy, I wanna know from you, what is the research article that you quote most often or that has made the biggest impact on your way of thinking or your practice? I probably have to say neuro rehab. So there's not a specific article, but there are like new advancements in diagnosis of neurologic cases and stuff. Instead of just the plain old fibrocardiologist embolism, there's now the, the ANNPE and the IHNPE, and there's all sorts of an acronyms that come with it. But, you know, from when I started a long time ago to where we are now, like how just diagnoses of neural things have changed and how we rehab them based on that diagnosis, you know, and it's kind of important to be aware of the research that's out there and, you know, and what you're seeing, you know, it might just might not be a straightforward FCE. It might be something else that might take a little bit longer and a little bit more time to rehab that as opposed to a straightforward FCE. And so I think that for me is probably the most exciting things to read about are the neuro rehab stuff. So I, I really like neuro stuff, <laughs> I guess. I agree with you. Neuro is always exciting, changing, challenging, <laughs> difficult. Yes, it's very so, challenging. <laughs> yeah. Big oh, yeah. Why are the dogs always like 60 pounds? I don't know. <laughs> About 30 kicks. And it's like, and they're down. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Always <laughs> interesting. So guys, if you're joining us live, let us know where you are in the world. Um, let me know what your challenges are in terms of time management and client expectations. And if you want to answer my question as well and tell me what the research article is that you quote most often or the research that has made the biggest impact on your way of thinking and your practice, share it with us. I'd love to hear from you. Um, we're also always giving away prizes. So although I don't have one to give you right now, I might, <laughs> at, by the end of this chat, I might have one. So um, share that with me and, and let's see what we can do. Um, so, okay, so Wendy, tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you do and why this topic is specifically important to you. Um, so my name is Wendy Davies. I am currently living in Florida and I work at the University of Florida Small Animal Hospital. I'm originally from mm -hmm. upstate New York. And for those of you in the States, there's two different New Yorks. There's an upstate and a downstate. So... <laughs> Downstate is like New York City, Long Island, that kind of stuff. Upstate is everything else. So I'm from everything else, um, farm country. So I grew up with cows. Um, and I am currently president of the American Academy or Association of Physical Rehabilitation Veterinary Technicians um, and all the fun that comes with being a president of something. So uh, I am very happy to have found rehab. Uh, I started out by myself a long time ago with uh, um, Dr. Kirk, Kristen Kirkby Shaw. Um, she and I kind of started the rehab start of side of things at the University of Florida. So, and then she grew up and left me. So I'm I was on my own for a while. <laughs> She's all grown up, and um, and so for a while there it was a little bit challenging because it was just me trying to figure out how to do how to see these patients, how to do the treatments. 
and stuff like that with, you know, with trying to fit in a doctor at some point around there to have mm -hmm. kind of have that doctor patient relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So I could still treat these patients and things. So i um, trying to go from a schedule like that with just me to a schedule now that has, um, I have three faculty and two residents and we're getting interns and I have three other technicians and now we have students rotating through and things like that. So just going from that to now I have a whole bunch of people and a whole lot more appointments and still how do you coordinate time? Time management is still a huge part of what we have to do. So whether you're just one person or you're eight people, time management is a huge thing. So just being able to figure out how to do everything efficiently and correctly Everyone's happy, dog's happy, owner's happy, we're happy, you know. So that's kind of a big thing of 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 what I I pride myself on being able to time manage very effectively. Oh, I I love that. It's quite a um I mean it's quite a contrast from kind of working managing one person's time to managing a whole team's time. Um, and how you kind of like how you book appointments and things looks very different, right? Um Absolutely. so yeah. So depending on the kind of the model that you have for your practice and the amount of staff, how like the services that you offer as well, um, how you schedule appointments looks quite different. So how would you how how do you schedule appointments if you're one person? What what is your recommendation? Because it's so easy for us when we're one person. It's easy and it's difficult, right? Because everything's right. on you. Um, which means if something goes wrong, it's all on you. But it also means you're only managing you. So you right. can, over time, if you need to, you can do a little bit extra here and there if you need to, but you can also burn out. So right. how, how, what should it look like if it's only one person? Um, yeah. When I first started out, I believe we had like evaluations were every hour, like if new patients kind of thing. Um, and then every like treatment would every half hour, 45 minutes, I think, when I first started out. So I had to fit in, you know, exercises, talking to the owner, going over things, going over exercises, how was the time before, water therapy, all that stuff in that half an hour appointment, which can be a bit challenging <laughs> if you're doing a lot of things. Um, and so you kind of have to pick and choose what you think is most important that day. So, you know, if the owners are having trouble with a certain exercise or something, then take that time to explain to the owners why you're doing it, how to do it appropriately at home, you know, stuff like that. Whereas if it's like, oh, we just want to work on strengthening, it's an older dog, we want to keep it moving, keep the range of motion going on, like, let's put them in the water, you know, so at least we can fill that water up a little bit, make them a little bit more buoyant so they can still get that full range of motion and not the bone on bone contact when they're in the water. So they're still moving and, you know, using those muscles, but not having as much pain. So it just depends on what you want to focus on on that day, because every time the patient comes in, there could be a different thing that they're concerned about. You know, it's not always, you know, it's like <laughs> I joke around with the students, you're not treating a cruciate you're treating the dog that has a cruciate, you know? And so it's like, what compensatory problems are happening? You know, I'm like, maybe today's shoulders hurt more so than anything else, you know? So, okay, let's concentrate on shoulder stuff, you know? And, and just being able to kind of tailor each appointment to what that dog needs that time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so time-wise, it can get a little challenging if it's just you by yourself, you know, mm -hmm. trying to, you know, cause, owners can be chatty, you know, and, you know, they sit in there and, you know, with you, if you're, if you have owners with you and, you know, they're telling you about their kids and grandkids and stuff like that. And you're like, okay, well, I got to go, you know? And so it's kind of, you know, people management is also a big part of what we do because for some reason, I don't know about you all, but in rehab, it tends to lend people to give them your life story. <laughs> so, you know, they're like very, <laughs> very open to, oh, and then this happened and my health yeah. problems and all that stuff, you know, so you kind of have to learn how to cut conversations and things. So you kind of still keep things on track, but also still, you know, make sure the owner is kind of invested in what you're doing as well. And don't think that you're brush them off and stuff. So that's a huge part of what we do as well. Um, you know, little sociology, psychology experiments that we are. So, um, but that seems to happen in, in our in our service quite a lot as we get a lot of, you know, backstory of what's going on, which is great, you know, because a lot of these patients we see for years, 
And so, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of become part of their family and the dog becomes a part of your family as well. So, you know, kind of get that, that bond developed with them and with the owners as well. So I like that part of it. Yeah, I, I think that's something that that most of us really enjoy about about our work is that we do get to connect with our owners in a really um, in a in a really real way, right? We're spending a yeah. lot of time with them over weeks and months and sometimes years, like you say, and they really do become a part of the family. So it's it's a very special relationship that forms, and I know that um, yeah, that's that's one of the big things for most of us. I, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who's more who's more like me. If you guys are more like me, I'm not a people person. So that one was always exhausting for me. And I love it's exhausting. The dog who just got dropped off and like the dog and I loved each other and had a great really? relationship. But the owner and I have only ever just said hi and bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they can be exhausting. Like if you get a lot of owners that are very intense and have, you know, yeah. talk to you all the time and you're not somebody that's a huge people person, like I, I'm very much introverted most of the time, you know, and so having to like put yourself out there and talk to these owners and mm-hmm. act like you're having fun, even if you're not kind of thing, it's exhausting, you know, and at the end of the day, you're like, I'm so tired. I just don't want anyone to talk to me or look at me, you know, mm-hmm. and, and so you just have to remember with everything that's going on to take time for yourself as well. Like if you need a break, you know, just be like, I'm going to just go take five minutes or whatever, just to kind of recharge. Cause for me personally, I have to do that. I have to recharge, you know, cause I'll just get so exhausted yes. that I can function. You know? <laughs> okay. So we're not too, too dissimilar. It's, um, it's why I think I gravitate towards the horses as well, because you're oh, yeah. alone most of the time, right? There's, yeah. It's very rare that the owner is actually with you when you're, when you're working with, with the horses. And it just, okay. I love it. It's like, it's like recharge time as well yeah. as actually getting my job done. So I love that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay. So one-on-one, one-on-one um, sessions, or I should rather say if you're one practitioner, um, so that comes with quite a few challenges in terms of scheduling and time management. What are the things that can go wrong um, if you're one person and how can we kind of manage those or lessen their effect? So I think one of the things is if you make your schedule too tight and someone's late, then it throws off the whole rest of the day, you know? So if your client comes in, five, 10 minutes late. Oh, sorry. You know, but do you take time out of their time or do you just push back every other appointment 10 minutes because that person was late? So that's something you kind of have to decide ahead of time, like what your policy is going to be. So that's probably one of the first things that can go wrong is just that, you know, you have this nicely planned schedule and all heck break loose. Another thing is, you know, the dog's not cooperating or heaven forbid the dog has an accident in the water. You have to clean that. Um, Those kind of things, those take time. Uh, Are you allowing time to have the dog go to the bathroom before it goes in the water kind of stuff? Um, Is that built into your schedule as well? So all these things, you know, can kind of throw a monkey wrench into the works if that's the, if that's what's going on. Sometimes people bring more than one dog with them, you know, like Mm -hmm. other buddies coming with them. And so that can be very distracting to the dog that's getting therapy. You know, that's happened to me uh, that the dog's so focused on his friend that (laughs) it's not doing anything for you, you know? So how do you tell the owner to be like, you know, this is great that they like to come and be together and stuff, but it's very Mm -hmm. distracting for the dog that's getting therapy, you know, and we want to really focus on this dog, you know, so is there any way that you can either leave him home next time or have someone else be here to sit with the dog in the car or something like that, you know, so um, those are kind of some of the big ones, I think, is probably the time, time thing being late um, is kind of a a bit of a challenge sometimes, because, you know, they don't think five, 10 minutes is that big of a deal. But if you have your schedule every hour, it's a huge deal by the, you know, if a lot of, if several people are five or 10 minutes late, that's like a half an hour, you know? And so you're like thrown off for the day and then you end up having to stay late to get everything done if you don't adjust the schedule according to when the person gets there. So I think those are some of the big things that can go wrong. Um, Okay. 
how how does the management of time and the team and the scheduling change if you have a bigger team if you have four or five or six people working how does that change so depending on each person you can kind of assign a job you know so if you have okay you two like i have two underwater treadmills i'm like okay these two underwater treadmills can run at the same time you know, so we can do double the caseload at the same time with those, you know, do you have volunteers? I have volunteers as well, you know, so they can kind of dry the dog off afterwards. And so you can put the next one in if that's how your schedule is running with just the treadmill stuff. Um, us personally, we have very few that just come for underwater treadmill at this point or swim. Um, we have a lot that drop off for like the day and they kind of get done whatever we want to do with them throughout the day. Um, acupuncture, laser, massage, ultrasound, swimming, ac uh, underwater treadmill, like whatever, therapeutic exercises, all that stuff we do. And, you know, we tell them to drop off for like three or four hours. Some dog, some people leave their owners for the day, you know, drop off in the morning and pick them up after work. So it's kind of like a doggy daycare situation. So with that time, we have a little bit more flexibility about how to get things done and when to get things done. I also have students as well. So they're learning how to do things. Mm -hmm. And so getting them the opportunity that's in not super pressure to get things done as fast as you can and still learn everything, you know, they kind of appreciate that it might not mean that all of these students are going to go into rehab but at least they know that it exists and that yeah. it's out there so when they do graduate and they do come across something you're like you know what you know this dog would benefit from rehab i don't offer it but these people do you know and so being able to you know have the doctors do the doctor stuff have the technicians or nurses do the nursing stuff have the volunteers do their stuff you know you can kind of make things run pretty efficiently as long as everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing, <laughs> which sometimes is like hurting cats, but you know, you try. So. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's quite cool in, in that, like, um, yeah, things can be much more efficient and you can kind of use your resources to the maximum ability, like to, or the, to their maximum extent. So I'm thinking, if you have two underwater treadmills and a pool, you can run three simultaneous appointments and you can make your appointments if you have volunteers working um, and you're splitting your appointments into, for example, um, physical therapy time and then hydrotherapy time and then X, Y, Z. Um, it also has, it means that you could have patients in the treadmill every half hour. Um, so instead of having our treadmill appointments, you can have half an hour or even 15 minute treadmill appointments. I don't know. I'm just yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the dog can still have a full hour treatment, but the treadmill is booked solidly, for example. Um, yeah. So that's that's quite a but that's quite a um, a trick to schedule that right and to plan yes. that. So that you're using all of your modalities to the maximum and yes. fitting the dog in properly. And I can imagine that it really helps having your dogs in. Um, in a daycare kind of situation in that sort of scenario because it yeah. makes it much easier for you to put them in where the schedule allows, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so like, you know, some of the dogs that will walk for half an hour, yes, they're on the treadmill for half an hour, but then some that are just starting, they may be only on for five minutes, you mm -hmm. know, but we can squeeze those in between the other appointments that are just coming for underwater treadmill or something, or even the ones that are coming for full rehab and a hundred, half an hour on the underwater treadmill or swimming or something. Cause we're able to kind of put them in where the, wherever we need to, when we have time. And we do have, we have like one of those chalkboard walls kind of thing where we write down all the patients and then we write down each of their treatments. And when they're done, you know, somebody checks them off because it's not just one person that's responsible for mm -hmm. one dog. Everyone's responsible. You know, obviously there's one student responsible, but like as far as technicians, nurses go like, oh, this one needs this. I'm going to do this. So, you know, and another one goes, I'm going to mm -hmm. grab this dog or whatever, you know, so you can kind of get things going that way like if i'm busy doing like a joint injection or something like that someone else can get going with this dog's laser or something so it just depends on how you how many people you have and how you want to set it up but i find that the drop-off works the best um just for client expectations as well um because a lot of times the owners don't understand 
why things take so much time, <laughs> especially in rehab, because there's a lot of stuff that takes a long time, you know, and, you know, especially even just acupuncture will take like an half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, not them not getting, you know, why do I have to leave my dog for two hours? Why can't you just do his exercises in a half an hour? And I'm like, well, we have to do an exam. We have to do this, you know, and just kind of explaining to them what exactly is involved. You know, the, the more you explain, the less you have miscommunication, I think. And so I think that, you know, explaining anything right ahead of time at the, at the get go is like, this is what the expectation is. Then most people have no problem dropping their dog off for X amount of time. Um, and that's just how our model is set up. Um, I know that other places, their owner stays for the entire appointment and stuff. And, and I know that that can eat up a lot of time as well. Um, as far as, you know, profitability margins and things like that. I mean, I work at a university, so yes, we want to make money and things like that, but it's not like the end all be all, you know, cause we're still a teaching institution. So I'm a little bit spoiled in that regard, as far as not having to, you know, really worry about the bottom line, although we do very well, you know, so that's not really a problem for us, honestly. There are so many different, um, yeah, different business models, essentially. Yeah. And I think that, um, it's, it's something that we need to think about each of us when we start out, like, what do we what do we want? What do we feel is going to give us the best outcomes? Um, and if you guys have listened to to our podcast that that uh, came out today, it's a um, it's an interview with Francisco Maya we were talking about um, having a minimalist practice. And essentially, his model is as like very few modalities, um, the majority just his hands. Um, and he speaks about why and how he set up his model because that's where he feels he has the best outcomes and at the end of the day that's what we need to do is what is giving us the best outcomes and that's what we need to go for um and so it's not really about having having everything right having that practice where we have the laser and the treadmill and the pool and the and 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 because it's not it's not necessary what do no, you need no it's not yeah and, and, and what do you feel that your patients are going to benefit from? And that's what you focus on. And so um, I like talking, we let, I mean, it's great talking about all the different options, all the different things, because how else will we know what we want, right? And, and, right. and yeah, what, what we want to achieve with our practices. So if you're in that place where you're kind of like, which way should I go? Do I want this um, this practice where like the scheduling is, Lisa Mason calls it, um, you have to be able to like play Tetris very well because you yes. have to. <laughs> yes, that's the <a> truth. <laughs> very well said, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> she, she did a training for us in the business bit in the business basics section where she spoke yeah. about that and I thought that was brilliant. Is that yeah. what you want? Or do you want to just be the one man band who has right. just like the barest minimum things? Or do you want a Francisco Maya kind of practice? Or like what is it that is going to pull your cup and give you the best outcomes at the end of the day? And that and, and that's also where we are going to have um our client expectations make the best, right? Is when we yes. are doing what we believe is the best. Um, and so really that's that's part of it. Um, and having excellent communication skills, like you've already mentioned, we have to be able to communicate so well with our clients what, um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why they should be on board. And um, I also love Francisco said um, something in the podcast or in the, the training that comes with the podcast. I don't know. There's so many. Um, <laughs> but he essentially said it's uh, it's actually our ethical responsibility and duty to to share what we can do because if we don't, we're depriving those patients of care that they need. And then whose best interests are we putting first? So it's really important that we learn to communicate so well so that we have our clients on board so that we can make the biggest difference for their dogs um Wendy what would your tips be for people who are struggling to um yeah struggling with communication and struggling with client expectations <laughs> good question um it's kind of I mean I think the biggest thing is like stay 
stick to your guns kind of thing. Because if you make an exception for this one person, then you're going to continue to make exceptions for this one person. And then you're like, well, since I did it for that one, I might as well do it for this one. And then all of your rules or quote unquote have gone out the window, you know? So if you set up your policy ahead of time, like, okay, if you're 10 minutes late, then that takes 10 minutes away from your treatment time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it might stink for them, but you know, and they might pitch a fit, but this is the expectation that you set up ahead of time. You know, like this is something that, listen, you know, I have a very tight schedule and if you're late, then it throws every, the entire day off, you know, if you kind of explain that to them, you know, so it, explaining things ad nauseum is probably the best thing that I can say. You can give people papers all day long and they'll read them, but they don't read them, you know? And so like by having here sign this because it says that you're responsible for whatever, that's great if you want to do that and have somebody sign that, but you really have to explain to them and not think like, Oh, I gave them that piece of paper in the beginning and not hope that they actually read it. You know, because a lot of times they might not, you know, they just, okay, whatever I'm signing, you know, that means I have to pay. Okay, cool. You know, but, you know, or, you know, if you want to get even more nitpicky, if it makes things like, okay, you have to spend, you have, a, you know, like a fine or something if you're late X amount of times or something, you know, just to kind of make them realize that your time is valuable, just like theirs is. Like if you left them waiting for 10 minutes, they'd be the first people to complain that you're mm -hmm. taking away their time and I paid for this. You know, whereas they don't think of it the opposite way. Like this is money that I'm trying to make, you know, by having my schedule this way and you're taking 10 minutes away from that, you know? And so mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is just communicating with them how important it is what you're doing for their animal. And hopefully they're seeing the benefits at home and also setting that expectation. Like, listen, you know, if you're late, I'm not going to be able to do as much stuff with your dog that session because I have this one that's waiting for me, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's just really important, like from the first appointment, just to kind of keep harping on that. Um, you know, each time they come, you know, like, great, thanks for being on time. You know, just kind of, you know, you're like a little kid, you know, positive reinforcement. I'm like you did such a good job coming on time today, you know? So, cause a lot of people are just chronically late, you know, and it's kind of annoying when you're trying to get things done. So I think that, you know, the more emphasis you put on, thank you for being on time and I will try to be on time too, you know, that it, it kind of makes yeah. it work a little bit. I mean, obviously there's always going to be weird things that happen, you know, like there's yeah. a car accident on the freeway or something like that, you know, but, you know, exceptions are always made for certain things, but as song for the most part is you kind of communicate with the owners what the expectation is, what you're going to provide for them and for their dog so that everyone's on the same page. I think that that's, that's probably the most important thing. So for those of you who are listening, um, yeah, I mean, we're here for you guys. We're here to chat with you what about the challenges that you're having. So what are your challenges in terms of time management? What do you find to be kind of the most, uh, the most common Thing that goes wrong right like Wendy's talking about clients being late um for me that wasn't really an issue because the time like appointment started on time and if you were late for an appointment then your appointment still ended on time and that's how it was so um that was never really a, a um a big problem for us people understood that um without it being um yeah, without it ever being an issue, what do you guys experience to be a challenge? What what is yeah, what is not working in your practice? Um, let's help you. So let us know and we can we can give you guys some advice or share our experiences and our knowledge about it. Um, we have some amazing, amazing resources as well in the members portal and in the free portal um, for for you guys uh, regarding time management, prioritizing your time, um, managing clients' expectations. Um, Megan has an incredible time maximization training that is like you watch that the team regularly because it just helps us get back on track you know you forget you forget the principles that you learn about managing your time and you need to then just be reminded and get back on track so what do you guys do that works what do you do that doesn't work let us know um yeah i have someone calling me <laughs> okay hi <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, what else do you 
else what else do you experience to be a challenge um clients being late would be one what else are you struggling with or struggling um, with sometimes? like you kind of think about like just preparing a patient to be in the treadmill you know do you have to put the mm -hmm. life vest on them do you have to put on waiters do you have to put on a wetsuit you know these kind of things are you cross tying them somehow into the treadmill or something like that you know so all these things it may not seem like you know oh this takes like 10 seconds this takes 30 seconds but they all add up you know so mm -hmm. kind of keeping that you know how long does it take for the fill how long does it take for it to drain because you, you know you can't lift a 40 kid dog out of the treadmill in order to dry it so you can get the next one in while it's draining, you know? So mm -hmm. these things you kind of have to take into account, like, okay, it takes this long to fill it, this long to drain it. Obviously the higher the water, the longer it's gonna take the fill it and the longer it's gonna take the drain it, you know? So all these kind of things you kind of have to think about that add up these little tiny pieces of time um, when you're doing a hydrotherapy session and stuff. If you have a pool, um, you don't have to wait for it to, well, depending on what kind of pool you have, you don't have to wait for it to drain or, or fill. Um, but, you know, putting the life vest on the dog, putting your waders on or wetsuit on, or are you gonna wear a wetsuit all day long, you know, or do you just have somebody in the pool waiting for you to hand, you know, here's your dog, you know, and, you know, does the dog not wanna go in the water, you know, cause you do have some dogs that are like, oh God, they put the brakes on, you know, and, and you're, so you're like, no, it's gonna be fun, really, you know, and you're trying to get them to go in the water, so struggle time is is a thing mm -hmm. you know as far as that goes you know once they get in the water like oh okay i get it this is good you know but sometimes because it's you know most therapy pools aren't like normal pools you know they're like mm -hmm. smaller versions of pools you know if you have it in your hospital or something mm -hmm. um and so they don't quite understand the concept as opposed to oh i have a pool in my backyard kind of thing yeah. and the dog loves it you know so i do have a lot of dogs that are like that i'm like oh my i can't get my dog out of the pool and then you try to put it in our pool and they're like, oh no, I'm not going in there. <laughs> like, that's not a good idea, you know? And so then you get them in like, oh, okay, this is fine. I get it now, you know, but they're just not, not don't quite understand. I'm like, why is it so small? You know, so um, all these kind of things, they take time, you know, to get them used to it. Or if you're just training a dog how to use the treadmill or something, you know, just are you taking time just to walk them in and out or in and through kind of thing? just to get them used to it? Are you just gonna, you know, leave them in there and just listen to the noise as it starts to fill up kind of thing and then drain it right away just as an introductory kind of thing? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll do that on initial evaluations just to kind of see an introduction to the underwater treadmill. It might not be like a full therapy session, but just something to get them used to, okay, this is what's mm -hmm. gonna happen and this is how it works and see, you're not gonna die, everything's great, you know? And look, you get peanut butter and everything's good, you know? So. You know, these kind of things you kind of have to take into account as well um, as far as time goes, you know, because it might not think mm -hmm. like you have, you know, oh, I have a half an hour. It's totally fine. Th yeah. That goes fast, you know, <laughs> so yeah. half an hour goes real fast when you're trying to get everything done on the half hour kind of thing. So, you know, how long does it take to dry them? Do you live in a northern climate where it snows in the winter and stuff? So do you have to blow dry the dog when you're done? I don't really have to worry about that because I'm in, yeah. I live on the sun. But other than that, you know, because you know it's stuff that I don't think about. You know, the mm -hmm. other people that live north from me, like, well, we have to dry the dogs off before the summer home after water. I'm like, what? Why? You know, I'm like, because they're gonna freeze to death. I'm like, oh, good call. You know, I'm like, it's stuff you don't think about. You know, like yeah. that when I, if I was gonna go to a northern practice or something, I'm like, oh yeah, you have to a lot of time for drying. You know, <laughs> that's very nice of you. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, drying can be huge. Drying can be huge because it's also really noisy, um, yes. and it requires space. Um, some dogs need to be washed off as well. So yes. I know there are, um, we, we actually, Meg has a chat with Priya behind the vet rehab practice with Priya Strerum, which is brilliant, guys. Um, and she does some work in a hydro practice where they have the, um, the drying rooms are completely separate and closed off. So essentially, the dog, like it's quiet. So the dogs come out of the hydro room, go into a separate area that they can be washed and bathed in and then dried and take as much time as, as is needed. And it doesn't impact the, the treatment sessions because the next dog can come into the treadmill yeah. and it's 
quiet and calm the environment. Um, yeah, because the blow dryers can be loud and that can be really yes. disruptive for the next client that's coming in. Um, and it does take so much time. So what is the best policy with that? Do you have a member of staff that is dedicated to drying that does that? So the dogs come out and they dry them and clean them, etc. I mean, that's a really nice service to also offer is to say, once the dogs come out, we're going to give them a quick little wash and we're going to dry them and it's going to be great. And um, <laughs> you can include a bit of a massage in that. I know like you can use the jets and things yeah. as you host them to just give a bit of a massage and you can make it a really nice, pleasant experience and part of the therapy. Um, and that's like that's a really nice thing for the owners as well to know. Or is it the owner's job and you say, here is here is all the stuff we finish the yeah. dryer i know there are people who do that as well and it works for them so um it just depends again on how you set yourself up and what works for you um but it is like you say all the little things that take so much time the transitions getting out of waders and into a wetsuit or out of your wet stuff and into dry clothes for your next treatment session you know yeah. and I can't remember, like how many times I've ended up going straight out of the treadmill, just wrap a towel around me, and then I'm on the mat and busy with um, yeah. electric therapy equipment and things dripping on, you know, the <laughs> mat, everything around me is wet. How it is. And the clients sitting across from me, I'm like, I should really be dry, but I'm not. <laughs> um, yeah. I, our um our model that um that i'm used to here in in south africa and that i found worked really well um is one one therapist is responsible for one dog for an hour treatment so we book them on the hour but our sessions are only 45 minutes and that allows us time to transition to do paperwork because the paperwork is, is always a problem and also to just be late right because you're always running late with a client who's padding or this or that and it just gives you that little bit of a buffer to say whether it's 15 minutes or ends up being two minutes you can run to the bathroom change your clothes, whatever you need to do, do the paperwork and then be ready and calm and relaxed for the next patient. Um, it also helped that we were in like the way that the practice was set up meant that the therapists could communicate with each other. So we could with one pool and one treadmill run three consecutive treatments at a time, right? We could be booked for three simultaneous treatments. Um, and each of us using a different modality. And then it's just a case of communicating effectively with everyone else. If two people want to use the treadmill for the same session, um, well then I will start with this and you start with the treadmill and then we'll switch around. Um, so it's just about that open communication. Um, and I was gonna ask you about that, Wendy, is how do you find communication within your team um regarding one patient if you guys are all responsible for different things but it's one patient how are you able like are you able to effectively transfer communication or information through to each other about that patient the way that it's set up or do you find that that can be a bit of a um a bit of a challenge um depending on who you're working with it can be a bit of a challenge it just depends on you know what we do is the like the nurses in in my area we all communicate very well so we all know what the other one's doing and things like that it's when you know if there's a new evaluation that is happening next door with a doctor and a student or something and we're not involved we might not know what's happening you know and unless they you know come and tell us or put up on the board what the plan is you know and if we have a plan then we know that if it's not checked off then it needs to be done you know and and if and sometimes even if it is not checked off, we'd be like, hey, did anyone do this dog's underwear or treadmill? You know, and I was like, oh, no, I didn't do it. And like, okay, well, I'm going to do this, you know, and then go from there. But um, our area, pretty much everything is kind of centrally located. So you can kind of look and see where the dogs are um, as far as where treatment lies and things like that. But it is really important, you know, as you say, like communicate amongst the team. Um, it's when you don't have the communication as things get fall through the cracks, you know, like, oh, I thought you did the treadmill. No, you did the treadmill, you know, and, and things like that. And so if it's not written somewhere, then I don't know it's supposed to be done, you know, and sometimes it, 
um, it, it might not be getting written up in the board. The plan not make the plan might not be written on the board for whatever reason. You know, the student knows, the doctor knows, but we as technicians don't know. So if the student's not doing actively something with that patient, we don't know what's supposed to happen with it. You know, so you know, communication amongst doctors to the nurses, nurses amongst nurses, nurses to students, students to nurses, that kind of things. We all have to communicate together to where everyone is, where everyone is. You know, I'm like, oh, I did that, you know, because I, we also, in my service, we also are responsible for hyperbaric oxygen. So I often run hyperbaric oxygens and that's in a completely separate area, you know, and so then I have no idea what's going on, you know, so unless someone tells me that, oh, so-and-so is here and needs this or something, then I can't kind of coordinate from my new office in hyperbaric land. Um, <laughs> you know, like, oh, this needs to get gone, especially time-wise, you know, because some patients, they want to pick up at one o'clock. Some want to pick up at five o'clock, you know? So if you have a patient that's going home bef at one, you're not going to be doing all the treatments on the one at five o'clock. You know, you have to explain to students, doctors, nurses, everybody. I'm like, see, this one stays all day and this one goes home early. So you probably want to get this one done earlier than that one, you know? And and just kind of, you know, common sense goes a long way. But I always joke around with the vet students that when they're in vet school, it kind of drills the common sense right out of their heads for some reason <laughs> because they have so much other stuff in it. Um, and they all, all agree. They're like, yeah, that's true. So, you know, you kind of have to, even if it seems obvious, you know, kind of state the obvious just so it's out there kind of thing. So I'm yeah. like, hey, you know, if you don't know what's going on, ask the doctor. I'm like, hey, do you have a plan for this crutcher? You know, do we want to put it on the board? Oh, yeah, I forgot, you know, so stuff like that. You know, as long as you guys continue to talk to each other, it's fine. It's when you run into problems when, you know, there's tension between staff members or doctors or something like that, then it can be a little, a real challenge to get things done on time and correctly. Um, if there's a lot of miscommunication or no communication or something like that. So you kind of have to fix that sooner rather than later um, in order to kind of keep things moving along the way they're supposed to, or else you end up building up a whole other problem <laughs> that you don't want to deal with. Brilliant. So if you guys have any questions, please share them now. Otherwise, that's my whole list done. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> I like talking um, to you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's yeah, we must do this more often. <laughs> so, guys, if you haven't yet, please mark your calendars, book it out. The whole day is unavailable on the 13th of November. You want to be at the Vetri Ab Summit live, guys. Please join us live. Um, we are yeah, live this year. So book the 13th of November. Don't try and multitask. Join us. It's going to be really discussion-based. Um, we have some really awesome lectures lined up. Our theme is research meets reality. I think tickets are going to be opening soon. We're very close. So lots of work going on behind the scenes. So get ready. It's almost time. Um, <laughs> I, I will share some more resources with you guys in the comments in a little bit about um, yeah some of the other resources that we have about managing client expectations and managing your time. Um, they're two really huge topics, actually. Um, so we have some stuff in the members portal. We have some stuff in the free portal. We have some great blogs. We have some incredible podcasts. If you're ever wondering about um, how to yeah how to move forward with your business model if you're ever wondering about like what do you want your business to look like the behind the vet rehab practice podcasts are so valuable because meg is literally chatting to vet rehabbers about what they've done and what they're doing now what works and what doesn't work um and and yeah, getting a feel for all the different business models out there. Some people work 12 hour days twice or three times a week, and then they're off the other days because that's what works for them. So there's, we all have a little bit of a different way. We all have different needs. We all have different lives. And we need to, at the end of the day, build businesses and build practices that support us as people as well, not only financially, but also emotionally um so that we're not burning out we're feeling fulfilled we're feeling like we're doing something that we love doing and we're actually getting something out of it because so many of us absolutely love this job but all we feel like we do is give 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 
and we end up in a space where we're burnt out, where we have nothing left. So that's not where you should be. It's not what you should be doing. You can have a business that also serves you as much as you're serving others. So yeah, if you need help, reach out to us and we will we will help you with that. Um, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> that was fantastic, yes. <laughs> Have a great day, Wendy. Thanks. Bye.